Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we speak to animal study scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Well, this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Now, ASA is a very fair-minded organisation and just recently, the enlightened board at ASA have decided to change their fee structures and they've decided to make the organisation slightly more expensive for people who are waged or in secure employment, making it 60 Australian dollars a year and therefore allowing it to be cheaper for those who are unwaged or in precarious work, just $15 a year. So I think you can appreciate that this means that every single person on planet Earth can be a member of ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. It's easy to pay internationally via PayPal. So think about joining ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Okay, let's get down to business. Well, once again, I'm on the beautiful campus of the University of Melbourne, one of my favourite places in the world in one of my favourite cities in the world. The sun is shining through the window. It's an absolutely glorious day in Melbourne, although a little bit crisp outside. And I'm really lucky this week to be joined by Dr. Laura Jean McKay. Yes, got it right. Wow, good on me. Everyone, oh no, don't drink. I got the name right. Now, Laura is a writer and literary animal studies research. Laura is currently at the University of Melbourne, but she's about to take up a position as a lecturer in creative writing at Massey University in New Zealand. Today, we're going to discuss Laura's story, King, which, imp- which appeared in Volume 21 of the journal Antithesis, is it? And that came out in 2011. Welcome to the podcast, Laura. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. It's wonderful to have you here. So, Laura... What inspired this piece, this work? This is uh, an early work. So it's 2011. Um, We're talking quite a long time ago now. And it was back when I was doing a few writer's residencies in country Victoria. Um, And one of them was in Laughing Waters, Eltham, which is is in Melbourne, um, on the bend of the Yarra River in um, Wurundjeri, Willem country. And there were just mobs of kangaroos, um, herds of ducks, I was going to say. <laughs> I don't know what they're called when they're walking around your house, but there were a lot of ducks, um, wombats. It was it was very animally. And at that point, uh, I, I was also researching uh, a book of short stories uh, about Cambodia, but I couldn't help but but be aware of these of these animals um, that were very present. And one night I was walking up the very dark driveway. And I nearly collided bodily with a solo male full-grown kangaroo. Um, I mean, it was it was like we had bumped into each other in a dark hallway and we were almost doing the dance where you don't know which way the other person is going. Um, and in that moment, uh, there didn't seem to be any aggression. Um, I didn't feel any fear for some reason, even though he was... He was my height, um, you know, sitting up and, and he didn't seem to show any signs of fear. And we stared at each other with confusion and then went our separate ways. Uh, and I was, I was captivated by this, this solo male who didn't seem to be part of the mob that I would see up on the grassy hills around the house and started looking into the idea of um, the rogue ma- male kangaroo who's often depicted as a um, often dangerous and, and violent figure um, and has often been kicked out of the mob um, because, uh, because of a territorial fight. Um, I was also really struck by the, the mutual, I don't know, the mutual moment of connection in encountering um, a, a being that is wild and yet was, was um, hanging around um, what I would consider my territory. And we realised that he might have actually been quite sick and he stayed quite close to the house um, for the next few days and then disappeared. So um, possibly to move to another territory or maybe he went off and, and died. Uh, so I, I 
I started thinking about a piece. Um, I guess I started to think about what it would be to um, be a rogue male kangaroo to have been possibly kicked out of the mob and um, what voice that might take on. Um, I'd already worked on a piece in the first person voice of the collective voice of chickens in the past and uh, I was interested in looking at this solo voice. Um, it is a it is a highly anthropomorphized piece, <laughs> um, as anyone who read it would know. And the voice that I read it in in my head is almost a sort of Raymond Carver esque, hard drinking sort of. You know, I was out in the bush. It was night time. You know, <laughs> um, but as I have have developed thoughts about um, what anthropomorphism is and and why we do that, I've become more comfortable. Uh, with with that voice that came out in that story. It's quite a, a violent piece. I was also quite uncomfortable about why there was such violence in that work. Uh, but I was have been reminded um, throughout my studies that uh, the animal world, including the human world, is quite a violent place. Uh, and it's it's worth exploring that violence, especially when you're looking at fiction, which which really relies on conflict uh, as, as part of the, the storytelling process. As someone who has been thinking about animal studies for the last um, seven years or so, I realise looking back at it that anthropomorphism isn't the problem here. And, and that's one of the main ideas that I've looked at through my critical work and also now in my other creative work. Um, and this isn't a new idea, but that it's anthropocentrism that is the problem in, um, in a lot of creative representation of other animal subjects. And uh, also a, another interesting aspect that strikes me about this work from a distance is uh, the use of colonising language in the piece. So this is a piece called King. It was initially called Rogue and then this, this kingliness came out. And so there's this uh, British colonising language applied to a, a Native Australian animal. And as a writer, I have started to explore that even further rather than pushing away from that. In the novel that I've, I've just completed, The Animals in That Country, there is also a lot of kingly and queenly language. And that's because um, in the interspecies communication in the novel, uh, it's, th it's through a human, a white uh, female's human perspective and her limited idea of what power is uh, can come through in these translations of of how we relate to other animal worlds. In a way, um, that is very problematic and I want to interrogate that. But also I think it shows the limits of human language. Uh, humans, we, we feel so powerful because we have language and, and we see the world uh, very much through this stance. But as Erica Fudge so beautifully puts, I think, if humans are so smart, why can't we speak ape? Why have we not been able to bridge this, this gap in communication, in understanding um, and also in awareness of other animal worlds? And I think that, that creative writing and fiction in particular is a really interesting way to to start to do that, to start to address our own limitations and also to to take back some wonder as well uh, in our relationship with other animals, almost to go back to uh, the times that John Burge's Why Look at Animals, uh, which talks about the first metaphors and uh, our original engagement with, with non-human others uh, as, as subjects worthy of wonder and consideration and, and representation. So, Laura, I read your story this morning and I really loved it. I think you're a really talented writer and it was just amazing to read. Well, I was back in 2011. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> I'm sure you've just gone from strength to strength. But I feel a little bit silly almost admitting this, but 
it wasn't necessarily clear to me what species of animals we're dealing with. Was that per- did I miss the word kangaroo, or was that purposeful? And if so, what was the purpose? That's really interesting that you point that out because I've read the story in Alice Springs uh, and surrounded by the beautiful uh, red red rocks uh, that surround that town. And afterwards, people, uh, mostly white people, came up and said, oh, I loved that story that you wrote about the dingo. And, you know, it was very obviously set in Alice and it's about the dingo, um, the dingo dreaming stories that, w- that are, you know, that are in this area. <laughs> um, and very f- and felt uh, that it was very much about another mammal entirely. I suppose in the story, even though it was very early writing uh, in my animal inquiry, I, I am looking at at mammalness um, and at common shared experiences of violence and common shared experience of of interaction with others. One of the things about the story for me is that there are no humans in it. Um, and in a way, to me, that's more important than than the species, even though I, I remember I did do a lot of research into, into kangaroo-ness <laughs> at the time. Uh, there, I, I haven't written a story for quite some time in which humans don't appear and I would love to return to that, especially because I feel that often there are whole universes carrying on um, when we look at at, um, the incredible ant structures. Um, You know, there are cities and and societies that carry on without human interaction or or, uh, encounter and uh, which, which, um, yeah, aren't reliant on us (laughs) either in a negative or positive way. Mm. Yeah, so now that I know that that the story is about a kangaroo it's it all makes sense beautifully but I don't know what it is about my brain but I my immediate assumption which I didn't I couldn't completely reconcile but I didn't try to come up with a better I tried to force myself to reconcile it rather than to abandon that and come up with a new starting assumption and that was that you were talking about a lion and I guess it was the word king. But what was interesting to me, because I thought it, 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 you were talking, it, this was a lion, I thought, oh, isn't that interesting? Laura's given the lion an Australian uh, way of speaking. This lion's this and that and blah. To me, I, it was a very strong Australian voice. And I did notice the word mob. And I still didn't challenge my assumptions. Absolutely fascinating. So... Laura, then, is there a great responsibility on your shoulders? You are speaking for these animals, telling us what these animals are thinking and feeling. How do you manage that weight of responsibility? Sometimes I don't. It depends on the day. Uh, So the novel that I've been working on has taken five years in the making, which in in novel land, for some writers, that's a long time um, and for some not. But uh, but it really was uh, almost a daily push uh, I really had to get over my horror of anthropomorphism <laughs> um, and I really had to also work through the horror of representation as well um, representing others and also the great unknowingness of of animal non-human animal communication um, it it is still something that I am am working through now even in these later edits of the story. Um, of the of the novel that I'm working on, I mean one one way that I have worked around this is through process. The novel's taken on a lot of um, a lot of different shapes. In the first iteration, I think it was a, a middle aged man, and then it was a young woman who was the narrator, and then at one point it was a cat who I, I really couldn't stay with for eighty thousand words, <laughs> and then finally um, I've, I've settled on a character who is um, and. Uh, a zoo guide with with some serious drinking problems, and so I am telling it through a human perspective. And so, um, when she speaks or is able to communicate with the animals, again, it's through the very mediated voice of the human. And I've become quite fascinated by that. Um, the idea of um, you know what would what would animals say to us if we could speak? I feel that because of the anthropocentric nature of of humans and the fact that most of us um believe that we are the central shining light in the universe and that and that um 
animals uh, are there for our use, um, pleasure, comfort, companionship, uh, that we would still, uh, and this is quite a pessimistic view, I feel that we would still... um, we would still relate to animals through our very anthropocentric uh, human perspective and that we would take what they said as as giving us some meaning. Mm. One of the struggles with, with um, giving non-human animals a voice in fiction is how would they speak? Um, how do I... How do I get a dingo, for example, who's, who's one of the main characters in my novel, how... Does a dingo speak in a way that um, is respectful, that does show agency, uh, that isn't poetic and wise? You know, the, there's always the animal character who comes along and tells humans what things really mean. Uh, uh, that isn't stuttery but yet is still quite non-human and distinct from the way that we might talk, which is quite a departure from King, which is in a very sort of colloquial colloquial uh, Australian, um, you know, bar voice, I would say. <laughs> so we've used the words anthropocent- anthropocentric and promorphic throughout. There might be some listeners who aren't really comfortable with that vocabulary. Could you tell us what you mean by those terms? Mm, sure. So anthropomorphism is uh, is the humanization of a non-human entity and traditionally we use it a lot in in animal studies especially talking about literature um, to mean placing a human identity on uh, say a cat um, uh, but traditionally this can be more more of a godly idea so um, we would anthropomorph anthropomorphize will we ever in animal studies be able to say that word correctly <laughs> Anthropomorphize gods are mostly as a way to be able to relate uh, these godly figures to our own lives, and and possibly that's where you know the stories of of gods taking on um, vengeful or jealous or um, joyous personalities comes from. And I think that we naturally do this with non-human animals as a way to relate to them. Um, and when it comes to anthropophy centrism, uh, we're looking at the basic idea that um, humans are the, the centre of the world and that everything else uh, uh, operates around us and for us. Mm. Mm, wonderful. So, Laura, I uh, assume that part of your interest in doing this kind of research and writing these kinds of stories is that you hope that the world or you imagine and hope that the world could be a better place for non-human animals. How does writing in this mode contribute to perhaps that eventuality or that journey or make a positive contribution to the lives of animals? I suppose it comes down first to um, the question, is is literature important? Um, a lot of people would say yes, a lot of people would say no. Um, if the answer is no, then it comes down to, um, are, are words important? Do words have power uh, in our world? And the answer is usually yes. Uh, so I suppose when I write about these subjects, I am looking using uh, using the power of human language uh, to try to change uh, human minds about animals, or if not change minds, then at least put an image or a uh, narrative in into a mind and open up some questioning. Why do we? Um, treat animals the way that we do? Why do we spe- use uh, language um, that is derogatory towards animals? And why do we use animal language like the words cow or bitch or dog or ape, which have you know very negative um, associations in the human world if, if we are spoken about in that way? And uh, I want to try to decentre these ideas and um, open up a questioning of the way things are and um, whether things could be different in our relationships. Wonderful. Well, Laura, I ask everyone who comes on the podcast to answer five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? I love your five quick questions, (laughs) Siobhan. Great. (laughs) Well, 
Question one. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? I think, and I hope that this is considered animal scholarship, I think that it was probably... uh, it was probably J.M. Kutsaya's, um The Lives of Animals, uh, which is such an interesting piece. For those who don't know it, it was a – it came out of a, an academic talk um, that he did. He conducted at a university. and But he stood up there and he started to tell a story. And that story became the story of Elizabeth Costello, um, which, be, which was a larger book and a, and a character that – has become uh, that looms so large <laughs> in many people's imaginations that some people I read recently think that Elizabeth Costello is a philosopher and um, who too was around rather than it being Kudzaya. And one of the things about that book is that it uses narrative, and I think Kudzaya does this very well. It uses narrative to start to interrogate um, very uh, deep. Um, issues in our world and I see that Kudzaya is now working on or has developed a more recent piece called The Glass Abattoir which takes uh, Elizabeth Costello's ideas even further into discussing the abattoir and what goes on. (laughs) Wonderful, yes. I love The Lives of Animals. It's a real favourite of mine. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? I would say a Again, that it was a story. <laughs> um, can that be considered? Absolutely, particularly when you're a creative writing scholar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Shiva. <laughs> I like that being included. <laughs> um, I would say that it was my chicken story, <laughs> and uh, which I, I mentioned earlier. So this was told in the collective voice of chickens living in uh, a cage battery scenario um it was it was my first story i would say in the voice of other animals and it was also my first story in a collective voice so uh it was very much you know we are here in the cage we are seeing the golden light we are shedding our feathers and i chose this voice because i felt that Uh, It was such, I guess that I wanted to convey the mass experience, the very, the very, the sheer number of of chickens that are in this situation uh, in the past now and increasingly into the future. We've been hearing that, um, that humans are consuming chickens um, on a, uh, on a far more regular basis now than they used to. So that was my first foray. It was actually in response to an artwork by Jade Burstall. Burstall uh, and it was a situation where I was shown the artwork. It was a, a video artwork of golden eggs being smashed and I wasn't told the context behind the artwork and I wrote this chicken piece in response and uh, at the exhibition Jade you know, contacted me and, and said, well wow, I'm a vegan activist and this, you know, I'm so glad that you chose to write about this. And uh, so that was a lovely experience, just looking at the power of, of visual art and, um, and how writers can respond to that. Wonderful. What a fabulous experience. If you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? I would say it would be Val Plumwood. Uh, her piece, uh, Babe, the Tale of the Speaking Meat, really changed things for me in terms of the fact that he was a scholar writing about fiction. <laughs> very exciting to me. Um, he was a scholar who was looking very much at how we represent animals. And also he was someone who uh, who really paid attention to uh, the, the language that we use and her term, the speaking meat. Um, in which she, she says, paraphrasing, um, you know, the pig speaks from the most legitim- delegitimated, delegitimized position in, in society, that of the speaking meat. Um, her ideas around uh, the fact that if, if animals could speak to us, we would probably, um, many of us, reel back in horror over what they had to say about us. Um, that I, fi- I find that a really exciting concept. And then her piece being prey as well, uh, she, she really uses narrative in her depiction of the escape from a crocodile and also her defending of the crocodile's rights to, to be a predator. Wonderful. 
What's the most important thing academics can do for animals? I have really pondered this question and found it so hard to come up with an answer. I mean, I think that because it is there is so much um, that we can do, uh, I, I feel that the most important thing we can do is to, to de- tell the truth, to depict very clearly um, and look very clearly at, at how human-animal relationships are in this world and, and how uh, we might start to reconsider them uh, on the page um, in the way that we speak about them in our activism in, in whichever form we choose. So if you had the power to change one thing about the human-non-human-animal relationship, what would it be? I think it would be to magically (laughs) get inside the collective human head and uh, just implant the words, it's it's not all about us, uh, to try to offset that that incredible um, focus on that we have on ourselves and the idea that that animals exist in this world for for our use. Mm. Well, Laura, what are you working on next? It sounds like your novel's a big part of it. Tell us about that when we can expect to see that. So uh, the novel is in the final editing stage. I'm working with an incredible editor at Scribe in Australia who is having a meeting with me on Friday that is called uh, the talking animals meeting uh, on you know how we can how we can best depict the speaking animals in my novel and so I'm just at a really wonderful stage with that it's coming out uh, around April next year in Australia and probably around June uh, 2020 in the UK so yeah it's it's just a, a bit of a dream come true to have this very difficult novel um, starting to really really take shape and and the non-human animal characters um, speaking in a clear, clear, strong voice on the page. <laughs> well, Laura, we, hopefully we can have you back soon after the novel comes out. But for now, how can people find out more about your work? Uh, I am on Twitter. You can find me at Laura Jean McKay. I also have a terrible website. If anybody would like to help me improve that, that would be wonderful. <laughs> it's uh, lauragenemckay.com. Terrible because it's a little out of date and, and needs some some um, tizzying up. And then I'll also be working at Massey in New Zealand uh, from, from June. So you can probably find me there and I'll hopefully be posting uh, some work that I'm doing there and I'm also on academia.edu as well. Wonderful. Well, Laura, thank you so much and thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal studies scholars about their work. Now, you can also follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals. We're also on Facebook at Knowing Animals and also Instagram. Finally, don't forget to leave a review for iTunes. Reviews make it easier for other people to find us. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals.